This is a power regulator I bought from eBay and um, it's described as a 4000 watt high power thyristor electronic volt regulator speed control and it came from E-Resistible and uh, it seems to be a fairly common item. It also, it looks like a piece of industrial control equipment you might find being used in the Chinese factories, actually in the machines themselves, or catering equipment. And I did notice uh, it's got a strong similarity in the casing to this 12 volt power supply, which I've also stripped down in the past. Um, but it's not completely identical, however it's sort of formed from the same sort of style. So looking at it, it's got the AC input and AC output, it doesn't actually mark what's live and neutral. But um, it's not got an earth terminal as such, but I'm thinking that this pin, this uh, screw here could probably take a, a crimp and uh, a ring terminal and that would act as the ground. So um, odd, odd it is, they, they've stuck a label on which uh, gives it the sort of range it covers, but then they've screwed the knob on that doesn't even fit within that range. And also the label's been stuck in this sort of blue film that uh, is on to protect the plastic. So um, if that gets peeled off, then the label comes off too. But having said that, it's going to, I think it would be installed in a panel. And uh, it might be that this indent here, they'd put a small screw in the panel and then they'd drill the hole for the knob and then they'd stick it through and you'd have the knob on the outside the panel and it'd be locked so it couldn't rotate. So I'm guessing that's the case. Um, so uh, let's uh, take that, let's take that knob off because I think I have to take that actually I don't know 100% sure let's uh, get this open anyway so I can see that screw definitely comes out and this one looking from the outside I can see quite a big heat sink inside it and uh, oh, that screw's just spinning there we go now it come off? Oh, tricky. All right, okay. So I'll put that out of the way because it's quite shiny. And what we've got inside, it's got the big heat sink and it's got a big triac. Um, I think it's a triac. And I'm also seeing a, a bridge rectifier in here, which is odd. Um, okay, let's uh, get the other screwdriver. Let's remove the circuit board. The bridge rectifier is kind of throwing me a wee bit. I'm wondering, it doesn't, means it's possibly not the usual, um, usual simple circuit like this. So there's a screw in there. And the circuit board comes out quite clean and uncluttered in the back. So that, uh, Triax, I'm guessing it's a Triax, I've just seen the ST logo. It says it's an ST BTA BTA 41600B. That's a, a very beefy, that's one of the biggest, beefiest Triax you can get in that package. It's a, a TO3P package and uh, the TO3P is it's basically it's the tab mounting version of what used to be a very popular and probably still is transistor mounting package. It was an oval package uh, that was designed to mount directly onto heat sinks. Um, so I'm just trying to work out. I can see they've uh, the two outer terminals are just linked together. I'm not sure why they didn't bridge the two inner terminals because that would have meant they could have saved a bit of track space. It seems odd that they've bridged it round, because uh, if it suffers any significant current flow, that could be the weakest point here. But having said that, it is quite a beefy track. The tabs of the track itself, the MT1 and MT2, have been folded across directly to the connection points, the fuse holder in this case, and onto the terminal in this case, that, so they're acting as sort of high current um, paths. Right, well, I'm 
being thrown off the track by this bridge rectifier, so I think I'm going to have to uh, reverse engineer this, uh, and I'll be back in a moment. Well, that took longer than expected, and um, I did what I usually do, and got a very nice contrast image, actually, off the back of the circuit board. It really is a, a good contrast uh, for taking a picture of. And then I reversed engineered it and got it wrong. I, I accidentally turned the uh, bridge rectifier and resistors back to front in the drawing, which meant that the resistors were down to the, the opposite rail. And that really put me, it really threw me off the track. I really could not work out what the bridge rectifier was doing. This is the correct configuration of it. And I still can't quite, well, I still couldn't quite place what it was because I have never seen this done before. Now, if we uh, look initially at the circuit, well, let's uh, rule out sections of the circuit for a start. This is a snubber network because it's across the main triac. And it's quite normal to have a 100 nanofarad capacitor, but they've used a 4K7, which is a magnitude or two out. I would expect that to be uh, 47 ohm or 100 ohm. In the classic um, snubber network, it would be 100 nano, 100 ohm. I don't know why they've used 4K7. That seems an absolutely huge value. It was so huge that I actually had to get the meter and measure it just to double check. And there's nothing else in the circuit that could affect that reading. So, yeah, it's 4K7 and it does tally up with the bands. That, that is unusual. I don't know if that's an error. Um, I may actually... De actually, I don't think there's any point desoldering. I don't think they've got the component values marked. Nope, they've just got the component numbers. So that's not going to help. I think that's an error, but um, apart from that, I also thought that was an error, but then I was really wrong about that. So cutting those out, here's how the dimming section works, the power control. It's designed for controlling high power AC loads, things like motors, lamps, heaters, things like that. And it uses a beefy triac, a very impressively beefy triac if it's a genuine component, uh, the same type, actually I, I use the one step down in my fairground light controllers, I use the BTA26 600BW, which was rated about 25 amps, and this one's the BTA41, which I think may actually be rated up to 40 amps, it's, it's a very beefy triac, and one of the other big advantages is it, is it can handle quite high current uh, fault conditions as well. Um, it does have a, a quick blow fuse rated at 10 amps, and although they state in the uh, eBay listing that it's a 4 kilowatt, yes, 4 kilowatt, which would be 16 amps, uh, 10 amps sounds more realistic because that's going to give quite a, a modest dissipation of heat from this heat sink as well. Typically you get about a watt dissipated per amp when you're using a triac to switch, so the heat sinks can get quite hot. So the... Uh, the triac has the interesting characteristic, it can switch AC, it can switch in both directions. And likewise, uh, with most traditional triacs, you can switch it with, say, any polarity, uh, as long as the current's high enough, for usually about 50 to 100 milliamps. But with modern triacs, the, particularly the snubberless triacs, uh, it has to be referenced to, it, it has to bear, a, the, the, the only trigger on three of the quadrants which is fine because with traditional circuits with opto-isolators and things like that, or where it's being derived from the uh, what's called MT2, that is the correct polarity to trigger it when with reference to MT1. I should actually mark those terminals on. This is MT1, which means simply main terminal 1. That's MT2, and this is the gate. And the gate signal is referenced to MT1. So what happens when you actually fire a triac with a pulse is that it will latch on and it will stay on uh, until the current flowing through it goes below a holding threshold. And what this means is for things like dimmers and things like that, or lighting controllers, when the sine wave starts, if you fire it at some point in that sine wave, it will stay on and it will go off as it passes over the zero crossing point of the sine wave, and then you fire in the opposite half. So that's exactly what it's doing here. If I hide this... What actually happens if, if this side starts going positive and this is going negative, current will flow through this variable resistor, a big beefy variable resistor. That's a monster of a variable resistor. And it will start, uh, it will be limited uh, to a minimum value by this 1k resistor. And it will start charging this capacitor, which is 150 nanofarad. 
And as soon as it reaches a voltage that exceeds the rating of this device called a DIAC, which is a sort of threshold, it's, a, it's like a bidirectional zener with a threshold is the best way to describe it. As soon as the voltage goes about, around about 30 volts, it will suddenly turn on suddenly and it will discharge a pulse of current from this capacitor into the, the triac and at that point the triac turns on and spontaneously it just shunts out the whole control circuit and it effectively kind of discharges this capacitor as well at the same time when it shunts out like that. And likewise, when the polarity changes, it does it again. However, here's where this bit of circuitry comes in. And as I say, I could not get my head around it. I ended up scouring the internet for um, various combinations of keywords with thyristors and rectifiers, things like that. And I finally found a application note by Little Fuse. Application note, where is it? AN1003, which had that arrangement uh, there and that's uh, I've blown this up to size to show you what actually happens here because it's quite interesting the th this is also when I realized that my schematic was wrong because everything was just arse for elbow it was just completely wrong so what the uh, rectifier does they've used a bridge rectifier to replace these four diodes and it's it's sensible it can be done and it's got these two resistors are basically connected to the plus and minus of the bridge rectifier and the AC terminals are connected one to the, the MT1 line and one to the top of the capacitor in the timing circuit. And the whole point of this is to ensure that when you turn this down to a very low level that it doesn't go unstable because sometimes with cheap dimmers when you turn the dimmer on it, so it doesn't really come on at first and then it suddenly jumps on. Um, and it makes it very unstable at the bottom of the range. And the reason for this is this. When, if, say for instance, this side goes positive, and this is negative in that particular part of the sine wave, and it starts charging through this resistor and it starts charge the capacitor up, but because you've got the resistance set very high, before it reaches the other side, the, cross, the other crossing point, it doesn't actually reach the voltage at which it can trigger the thyristor, uh, trigger the uh, diac and fire the triac. And you end up with a situation that it passes into the other half of the sine wave, but there's all, already a positive charge on the capacitor. And now, when that side goes negative, it's not starting to charge capacitor up negative. The first thing it has to do is discharge capacitor before it can start charging up negative, and that knocks the timing off. So in that instance, what happens with this, these networks is, if this was positive, and it hadn't triggered the diac, so it still had maybe about 20, 25 volts on it, uh, when, as soon as the polarity changes, it goes past the zero cross point, the polarity changes, this side goes negative, that current will be immediately shunted through this diode and through that resistor. And likewise, it happens, if, the, if this had a negative charge on it, it would be shunted via uh, this uh, resistor and this diode. But the reason for the other diodes is to stop them actually having an, an effect if, on charging that capacitor. So... If this side's positive, the, the fact this diode here means the current can't flow through this resistor, through the diode, and charge that capacitor up, because it will effectively be shunted at that side straight down to the MT1, and therefore you'll only get about 0.6 of a volt, which will have virtually no effect on that. So that's what it's for, the bridge rectifier, and it's quite a clever arrangement. Um, it's... Uh, really is just to make it more stable at the lower levels. It's, it gives it effectively a wider stable range. Another advantage of that is that if you're controlling inductive loads like transformers or motors, you're not going to go into a dodgy situation that you end up with a slightly non-symmetrical waveform because motors, uh, well, most standard induction motors and transformers hate uh, if their sine wave isn't is being half wave triggered or or not quite symmetrical it creates a, a a bit of heat in the transformer and it makes it sort of make a loud buzzing humming noise so um yes i've learned something i've learned this uh, from this application note uh, something i didn't know before and it's been implemented in here so the only thing that's wrong with this controller is that really oddly high value 4k7 resistor and um, i don't know if you guys have encountered that in a, a in a snubber network before um, if you have just let me know in the comments down below because um, I still can't help but think they've made a mistake that was either supposed to be 47 or 100 ohms so um, yeah
It's, it's, it's a neat enough unit. Oh, it's worth mentioning. As with this little unit, these things uh, would create a lot of electrical interference because the way they work, well, I'll just do a quick doodle. If this is a sine wave, the way they work is if you've got it set at half power, it actually turns on here, and it's on for that cycle, then it turns off, and then it times, and then it, uh, it's on for that half of the cycle. And it means that at these points here and here, you get a very sharp current spike. So normally you'd have to put a choke in series with it uh, to actually filter that spike out. And that's why often you'll find with the older household dimmers, there's quite a big sort of toroidal core inside with the windings all wrapped around it. That's the suppression choke. I, don't, I, I was going to say it's not so critical these days because the, it used to cause lots of interference on radio channels, particularly shortwave or AM. Or amplitude modulation was the one it tended to make a lot of noise on. Uh, and they're not really used so much these days, but I don't think the radio amateurs would be too thrilled about me saying that. They, they probably want us to suppress stuff as much as possible. I would guess in China they probably don't bother, but um, yeah, if you're going to do that, uh, a toroidal choke, some beefy choke, would certainly help uh, limit those transients. But uh, oh, the other one thing I'd change is I'd change the fuse for a ceramic one. Glass fuses at mains voltage are only rated, well, at any voltage, they're only rated to break about 35 amps. And a short circuit will be considerably more than that. So um, if you put a ceramic 20mm fuse in, they are actually rated to break closer to 1,500 amps, which gives them a much greater chance of actually breaking the fault current uh, because they get sand inside to help quench it uh, when the wire breaks. Um, so that's a much better option, the ceramic uh, fuses. But um, they're more expensive, and that's probably why there's not one in here. But other than that, it's quite an interesting little industrial unit. It's a... Uh, Neat.